rigorously uh, over these many years. The first step in that, some of you have seen me uh, talk about this before, I suspect, is undertaking human Earth orbital flights, figuring out if we can survive in a very harsh uh, environment in space. That, of course, is Project Mercury. Uh, the effort that we'll be celebrating the 50th anniversary of on the 5th of May of this particular year, they mark the calendar. There will be some activities associated with that and test at the end of this half hour. Uh, so that Earth orbital flights was the first step in the, in the, in the process. Uh, secondly, we're going to build a week for useful space that will enable us to go to and from Earth orbit relatively easily, economically, and safely. Everybody knows about that. And finally, we're going to have a, a beachhead in Earth orbit, a, an orbital space station that will allow us to go uh, to other places, specifically to the moon and to Mars. Those uh, were, was a set of five integrated steps developed initially in the Collier series of articles in the 1950s, ensconced in the NASA long range over and over and over again since that time, and at some level we're still following this particular script. That goes back to 60 some years ago. We changed the model just ever so slightly in the context of 50 years ago, actually on May 25th of this year, in which John Kennedy said, let's go to the moon. And all we had done was send one astronaut, Alan Shepard, into a relatively short suborbital flight at that particular point. And Mercury was not even up and running in a full sense of the term when that particular thing happened. This was a very odd set of circumstances that created an environment that made uh, a political decision take place. And this is not to be repeated in our lifetimes. We will not see it again. As many people as, uh, as I have heard over the years in the space community talk about how if we could just do this again, all would be perfect. Uh, it's just not going to happen. In fact, for about a six week period between the middle of April and the end of May of 1961, the way I like to phrase it is the moon was in the seventh house. Jupiter was aligned with Mars. <laughs> the cosmic tumblers had clicked into place. And John Kennedy could stand up and say, I believe that this nation should commit itself before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. By the way, Buzz Aldrin once said that returning him safely to the earth part was his favorite part of the speech. <laughs> but he was able to do that and get away with it. And, a lot, and Congress was willing to support this, uh, not just with uh, applause at the time that he gave the speech, but with appropriations to make it a possibility. But I will also tell you that by the end of that month, John Kennedy's budget director had come in to see him and he said, have you seen what it's going to cost to go to the moon? NASA is going to break the bank. And Kennedy went for his first summit with Khrushchev in June uh, to Vienna in that particular year uh, and proposed turning Apollo into a joint program with the Soviet Union. That's a little known fact, but it is nonetheless true that this might have turned out strikingly differently uh, and it did not have to go the way in which it went. The, the reason that Kennedy was willing to make that speech was because of a whole series of things that were surrounding and circling around his administration that uh, came to a head in the mid part of April. One was the Yuri Gagarin flight, uh, which took place on the 12th of April of that particular year. We we'll celebrate that 50th anniversary just in another week and a half. Um, the other thing was almost on the heels of that was the Bay of Pigs invasion, a disastrous attempt on the part of American-backed uh, Cuban exiles trying to retake uh, Cuba from Castro that gave the black eye to the administration like you wouldn't believe. And there's a whole number of people uh, uh, in, in the political processes in Washington who are saying, you know that John Kennedy? That young guy is only 43 years old. Uh, served a little bit as a senator but never really had much experience beyond that. I don't think he's up to this job. Heard that before recently, by the way? Um, that's also the case with John Kennedy. Uh, and his response to that was, I got to do something that's going to put this beside, behind us and move on to something else. His result was, let's go to the moon. We're not going to 
see that particular constellation, those cosmic tumblers clicking into place in the same way any time again in our lifetimes. But we did, of course, go to the moon. Everybody does believe that, don't they? <laughs> it always gets a big laugh, and there's a lot of people who raise their hands, increasingly more than I would like to see, saying, I'm not sure about it. Forty years ago, we did go to the moon. It was an enormous investment for the time. $25.4 billion in then-year dollars. Multiply it at least by six uh, to get what we got today. Six successful landings, three circumlunar flights, one of which was not ended as a circumlunar flight, Apollo 13, in which we nearly lost that crew, but they did alive and should be required viewing at NASA in it, the Apollo 13 movie, uh, which celebrates uh, the people at Mission Control, the folks on the ground who made them come home, as well as the astronauts uh, and the activity they engaged in to come back from a near disaster. The technological advance was quite significant. We could talk about uh, the very aspects of this uh, at some detail in another time, uh, but it was important. And the scientific return. Okay. One of the things that I like to point to is that we did not undertake Apollo for scientific purposes. It was an afterthought, but it was a stunning afterthought. Uh, and a number of years ago, uh, lunar scientists got together and came up with their top ten list of what they think we learned by going to the moon. And I'm sure there was a lot of, uh, of debate and discussion amongst that community as they came up with that list, but it's a very interesting one. And it's a stunning example of, of the kinds of things we might be able to accomplish um, when, when they work together with the engineers, the politicians who were doing it for an entirely purpose and the science efforts that resulted from it. We didn't do it because everybody thought it was a great idea. I've been beating this drum for years now, and some of you have probably seen this kind of chart before. Uh, if you track the, um, the question, Apollo worth cost, that is the blue line. And the answer, yes, it's worth the cost. And you can see that it starts off in the mid-30s, it goes to the mid-40s, it comes back down to the mid-30s. The only time that more, more than 50% of the public say that it's worth the cost is at the time of the Apollo 11 landing. And then it goes right back down. It's not worth the cost. If you ask the question, and, the, and you get the yes answer. Are we spending too much on space? The yes answer is tracked in red. And what you see again is it wiggles up and down a little bit, but then about the time that Apollo reaches fruition in the late 1960s, it starts to take off and it's above, it's almost 60% when the last track of the last, uh, uh, of the last mission in 1972. Um, Yes, it's, we're spending too much on space. If you divorce the whole thing from money, do you approve of Apollo? That is the green line up above. Everybody loves it. It's almost 80% at one point. Uh, it never dips below uh, about 60%, or just slightly below 60%. Everybody loves it. They don't want to pay for it. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> it should, because nothing has changed. Not a thing. We don't want to pay for it, but we do like it. And you ask people on the street that, you go to the museum and you ask them, people that were there, any group that you would wish, at random samples that are done on a scientific basis, they're all going to say the same thing. And it's going to look a lot like this. We didn't do it because everybody w wanted to do it. We did it because it was a Cold War objective. It was viewed as something that was necessary for national security purposes in the context of this large Cold War rivalry with the Soviet Union. And, uh, and it's hard to get youngsters to understand. I talked to a lot of, of, of student groups. And, uh, and, and even the college students are not old enough to remember the fall of the Berlin Wall. Uh, and, and increasingly so as the years pass. And they certainly don't understand, as some of us who are a little bit older remember, duck and cover exercises when we were kids in grammar school in the 1960s where you crawled under your desk that, like that would protect you from a nuclear blast. <laughs> it's hard to get that across, but it's very important because it is critical to understanding why we did this. We don't have an environment like that. We are, don't, and Lord help us, I don't hope we never see another environment like that. Uh, but that's what drove the funding for Apollo at the time. So what do you do for an encore after you've gone to the moon? There's a whole series of possibilities, but let me just 
suggest to you that amidst all of these things that you see on this, on this chart, the Space Task Group Report from 1969, the Space Exploration Initiative from 1989, the Vision for Space Exploration in 2004, when you look at those things, they are very similar, and they are very similar both to each other and to the earlier concepts that I laid out for you in that first slide, where you, go, where you build a wing reusable vehicle, you build a space station, you go to the moon, you go to Mars. And we have continued to do that, that same particular approach, low these many years when it comes to humans. There's a departure from that uh, with the, the 2010 uh, uh, decisions by the Obama administration, but not until then have we seen much in the way of change. And for the folks in this audience, you'll be well, well familiar with, the, with attempts to return to the moon and ultimately to go on to Mars with human explorers. That's what NASA wanted to do. They couldn't get opinion or approval to do all of those things. And in fact, in 1969, when the Space Task Group report went out, uh, they, per, they proceeded to argue for a shuttle, for a station, for a lunar base, and ultimately for a Mars expedition. The Nixon administration said, there's no way on God's green earth you're going to get all this stuff. What's the one thing in this list you can do that does not require all the others? And the shuttle was the result. That got approved in 1972. So we could build a space plane, and we did. And there's been a long history of the desire to do this in America. This new show that I mentioned to you, Moving Beyond Earth, where we're talking about shuttle and station and space, human space flight since Apollo. We'd, we ran back and looked at the history of the early part of this century and found that if you go back to the Buck Rogers concepts of the 1920s and 30s, and that's that chart, that, that illustration that you see on the left there, all of those vehicles have some type of wings on them. And that's what we thought we were going to do, is build a winged vehicle. If you look at the 1930s and 40s, the Eugene Sanger and the Silver Bird, that, that top uh, air plane in the middle, which has got uh, German logos on it, was going to be a bomber, a skip bomber, that was a, that was a rocket plane that would go up to the edge of space, get up across the top of the atmosphere, and bomb New York City from Germany. He's just serious about this stuff. He did paper studies. They never got to the point of building prototypes. But nonetheless, that's an idea that emerged. You see the same sort of thing in the Collier series in the 1950s, which you can see at the bottom in the middle there, of a winged reusable vehicle in orbit. And in the 1960s, we continue with this concept, and the Dinosaur X-20 uh, spacecraft is going to be launched on top of a Titan II rocket. You can see it on the right, an Air Force program. All of these are space planes. That's what we're going to build. And lo and behold, that's what we end up building. 30 years ago, it starts to fly, and it's been a marvelous uh, a vehicle in so many ways, uh, and in other ways, such a horrible disappointment. And I think everybody in this room would agree that it's got these wonderful pieces to it, and it's got these tragic elements as well. Uh, but it's been flying now for 30 years, and it's about to go uh, off to, I hope, an honorable retirement. And, uh, and, and we'll see uh, what happens in terms of its replacement and where we go into the future. But this is where we've been in the recent past. No sooner do we start to fly a space shuttle in 1981 than NASA began to work very hard to get the approval to build that next piece of that puzzle that, uh, that I talked about at the beginning, a space station. Uh, and in 1984, got the approval from the Reagan White House to proceed with one, and ultimately we end up 10 years ago with the first occupancy on the International Space Station. I would suggest to you that this is an enormous accomplishment. And it's enormous not just because of the technological uh, capabilities of it. When people look back 100 years from now, from now on this particular endeavor, what they're going to see is an international consortium doing a really big, difficult, high technology activity uh, in a, uh, for peaceful purposes uh, that, uh, uh, that has never been done in the history of the world. And that's what it's going to be remembered for. Uh, now, it may, there, may, there may be great research that emerges from it, there may be all kinds of other important things that draw out of it, but I would be willing to bet that that international component will be the key that people look at off in the distant future back on this particular endeavor. And, and now a little, a little more dose of reality to this. Um, 
I, you probably seen charts like this before. Uh, I, I've been tracking this kind of stuff for a long time. The NASA budget is a percentage of the federal budget, starting in 1990 and running to the present. And what's the dominant theme here? Uh, <laughs> it's pretty well downward. Uh, it, it, there's a there's a brief spike. Uh, in 1991, uh, and then right back down uh, traditionally. I used to say that the NASA budget was approximately 1% of the federal budget. Guess what? It's not. Not anymore. and hasn't been for a while. Uh, it's now about a little less than half of 1% of the federal budget. And there's no reason to believe that that trend line is going to change anytime soon. Uh, so the question that people involved in space flight have to be concerned with is how can we do the things we want to do that I think we can legitimately say are things that should be done in the context of, of space flight, space exploration, and human activities within the confines of this kind of funding profile. And if we can go back to the moon, if we can go to an asteroid, if we can, I don't think I'll see it, if we can go to Mars, and within that context, great, everybody will cheer. But there's no spike in the budget that anyone can foresee. Uh, and that's, that's one of the, the great concerns that people have, as well as one of the great challenges we have before us. How do we move forward with a new vehicle for human spaceflight? How do we get out of low Earth orbit uh, and go other places uh, in a way that is economical while also being safe? That's a real difficult task. That's the, that's the challenge that NASA and the space community writ large has before it for the foreseeable future. And if we can't figure out a way to do those things, at least to get out, out of, at least to get up into low Earth orbit, we're not going to be able to do much else. We've had great accomplishments on the space shuttle uh, and on the space station thus far. A few, a few pictures that I'm sure you've seen them all before. One of the other things that I think that when we look back 100 years from now that's going to be important in the history of space flight is, is the bringing into the human space flight endeavor in ways that had never been before, uh, the, uh, the capabilities of the former Soviet Union, the Russians, uh, and the negotiation of those deals between NASA and the Russian Space Agency in the early 90s to bring them into the space station, to incorporate uh, the Russian capabilities into the larger scheme of human spaceflight activities for the United States is an enormously significant accomplishment. Uh, it does a whole series of things that were important for the United States in the 1990s and remain important and right up to today. Uh, so I would highlight that in the context of the shuttle mirror missions that are depicted on the lower left-hand side of that particular screen. Uh, building the space station in the upper right-hand part of that screen and the lower right-hand part of that screen is another one of those endeavors. Doing things with the Hubble Space Telescope is another. Those are, if we, if we didn't do anything else, it was probably worth it just for that. But we did a lot of other things as well. And I always like this picture of Mary Ellen Weber, and some of you probably know Mary Ellen, uh, from her 1995 mission uh, in which she's undertaking research on the space shuttle at that particular time. We've now flown the shuttle for 30 years. There's been research done on every particular mission. I would love to see, like the lunar scientists did, uh, I'd love to see a top 10 list of what did we learn from 30 years of experimentation on the space shuttle. I haven't seen that list. Maybe it exists, but I certainly haven't seen it, and I'd love to see it. We've had tragedies, as we all know. Uh, Columbia and, uh, and Challenger were, were, were enormously difficult experiences for all of us. We had deaths in the family, is what it came down to, and it was tough. Um, but, as we all know, uh, this is a part of a very difficult task of, of getting off this planet and going someplace else. I like this particular cartoon. Maybe you've seen it before. Uh, it, it was from a newspaper in, in Texas at the time of the Columbia accident, and I think it kind of bespeaks uh, the, the issues associated with those tragedies. As the astronaut standing on the moon, we all know the picture, so triumphant, saluting the American flag uh, at the Apollo landing sites. Uh, now, head bowed and the flag at half-mast. But one of our issues is expectations. How do we manage those? 
I was brought up with, with uh, stories of going to the moon and going to, uh, going to Mars and astronauts as heroes. Uh, I built rockets when I was a kid and flew those things and I couldn't handle the math or I would have been an engineer. But uh, I can still write about it. And, um, and, and, and there were all of these grand expectations. And you see them depicted on some of these pictures here. Some, you've seen a lot of these before, I'm sure. Uh, up in the upper left, the Chesley Bonestell famous picture of the winged reusable spacecraft, a space shuttle, if you will, uh, with a wheeled space station off in the distance uh, floating over the Yucatan Peninsula. This is from the Collier series in the 1950s. And we thought that this was the things that we were going to see, and we were going to see them very soon. I mean, within the next decade or two at the most. And here we are, 60 years down the pike, and we still don't quite have those things yet. Uh, we thought we were going to see in the 1970s these huge uh, colonies in space built in these, in these spherical, uh, uh, sometimes Bernoulli tubes, sometimes other things, uh, where we could live and work and enjoy life and, and be in this entirely different and new environment. You can see that on the lower left. That didn't happen either. We've talked repeatedly about possibilities for lunar exploration and the upper right is a picture that I really do like uh, that, uh, that suggests what a lunar base might look like and that picture was drawn in 1986. We don't have anything like that nor are we going to see anything like that in our lifetimes. And then finally another one uh, down in the lower right. These expectations are out there. It has become uh, something that we've all looked forward to and I would suggest to you that when the reality does not match these expectations we have some difficulties and we have it with the public at large. Here's another one that I just love. I went crazy when NASA produced this in the education department in the 1990s when I was there. I said, are you kidding me? <laughs> and they did lithos and they passed them out to every kid that they could find. Um, of the lunar games, the lunar Olympics on the moon, can you imagine what a pole vaulter would be able to do in 1.6G? Uh, well, that's the kind of thing we're talking about, but it's expectations that are just going to be dashed in the future as we don't, uh, as we don't think about about that. Which brings me to uh, another piece of here. Uh, wh where's my jetpack? Where's my colonies on the moon? There is a, uh, an episode of the West Wing. Do you remember the show? In which Leo McGarry, who was the chief of staff in the West Wing for that fictional show, uh, was being talked to by one of his underlings about more funding for NASA. And he just says, what a waste. He says, my generation was cheated. Where's my jet, jet pack? Where's my colonies on the moon? They promised me all this stuff. Where is it? That's the real problem that we've got. It is a problem. And, and I like this family circus cartoon on the right. So where's my jet pack? There's, uh, there's obviously Space Family Robinson on the left, if you remember them from the 1960s, and the jet pack there, um, where the kid says, you know, someday I might travel to another planet, but I'm not sure why. And we have these expectations, but we also can't seem to figure out why we need to carry them out on the, on the uh, schedule that we want to carry them out or for the reasons that, uh, that are compelling to everybody. It's a real problem. So again, where's my jetpack? That's a question I would ask of the folks in this room as well as anybody else. Um, we've had historical drivers for exploration, and I'm going to try to draw this to a close in just a minute. Um, and, and I've shown you pictures of Columbus, polar exploration, undersea exploration. And there's been three historic drivers for exploration on this particular planet. Um, conveniently, you can label them the three G's, and, it, and it's catchy and easy to remember. It's more complex than this, but this boils it down to a, a fairly basic level. One is God. People undertook exploration and went to new lands to encounter new individuals that they could then bring to them their religious beliefs. No question about that. That drove, that drove exploration in the Americas, that drove Africa uh, and other places around the world. Well, we haven't found anything like that on the moon. Uh, and we haven't found it on Mars either, and I'd be willing to bet it's on neither place. Um, so there's not going to be any religious compulsion for going there and trying to convert the natives. <laughs> Secondly, gold. Is, is there some monetary benefit that's 
pressing. You know, the Spanish were great in terms of exploiting the Americas for wealth and extracting it and making them the world power in the 1500s and 1600s. Um, and it was because of the extraction of, 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 of precious metals, especially gold and silver. Uh, what is that great, powerful, economic driver that gets us to go to the moon? I mean, Jack Schmidt will tell you it's helium-3. Uh, maybe it is, but we haven't been able to really turn that into anything yet. Uh, is it something else? We don't know, but we don't have it. And then there's another, glory which we do have in abundance and the human spaceflight program has been predicated in no small measure on that particular agenda, prestige. We began flying humans in space in the 1960s for this prestige purpose to, to show the world that we were second to none. The Russians did the same and oh by the way the Chinese when they first flew their Taikonaut in 2003 did it for the same reason. They wanted to show the world they were a world power second to nobody. Uh, and if other nations enter into this particular activity, they'll do it for the same reason, at least initially. All of that changes if these other objectives uh, are possibilities for the future, but we're not there yet with those. Finally, say something about uh, the Obama initiative to, to try to move toward more commercial activities. I am, when, when I first heard what the president said about relying upon the commercial sector more and more, um, uh, I was struck by 2001 A Space Odyssey. Is anybody here willing to raise their hand and admit they've never watched that movie? I didn't think so. Um, everybody's seen that movie, we were brought up with it. Well, one of the things about that particular movie was that uh, as you watch it, I mean, there's obviously the monolith and all that nonsense, but, um, but there's, there's also this sequence where the central character who's the head of, uh, of, the, of the science activities who has to go to the moon flies to a space station in orbit, and you can see the picture here, uh, on a winged reusable vehicle that is run by Pan Am. He goes onto the space station and he goes to stay overnight in a Hilton. And then he goes and calls back home on an AT&T phone video phone, but nonetheless a phone. Low Earth orbit has ter been turned into a normal realm of human activity in which the governments do not dominate what is taking place there, at least insofar as we can see there. Now, Pan Am doesn't exist, and oh, by the way, neither does Mall Bell anymore. But I hope you get my point. At some level, we are engaging as they had engaged in the film in taking and incorporating into the normal regime of human activity low earth orbit. Something that you do as a matter of course and as that happens government activities recede into the background and are not the dominant players necessarily the way they were in an exploration environment. When you go to the moon in 2001 it is a government activity. Uh, but but not low Earth orbit, not in the same way. Perhaps we're going to see the same sort of activity take place in low Earth orbit in real life as more and more commercial type activities are engaged in there uh, with humans aboard uh, and, and NASA's activities are then fo refocused, I would like to think, beyond low Earth orbit to the moon and elsewhere. Uh, with robots, with humans, with whatever we can muster in terms of the resources to send. Uh, I'd like to see that happen. I hope I live to. Uh, and, uh, and with that as the case, I will get off the stage. Um, so thank you very much. Do we have any time at all for a question or two? Okay. Okay, one or two. Anybody got anything? Nobody wants to argue? Yes. Well, well, the, one of the one of the motivations, yeah, one of the motivations that sh uh, you showed was the um, in the lower left, which was uh, a space colony from the L5 Society. Yeah, and the the motivation or, or driving, you know, my financial benefit was energy, right. building the solar power satellites, right. and so that struck me as. You know, still viable today, even more so with uh, risks of nuclear power, or shortages of oil, blah, blah, blah. So where do you see that uh, stand in the picture for the future of, of funding some of this 
you know, profit making commercialization. Well, I think we've got a long way to go before we see the large scale sort of solar power satellites that can, that can really take over the energy grid here on Earth. Uh, there, there are some interesting things underway along those lines and I, I've been talking to some of my friends over in the uh, uh, over in the DOD and they're saying that you know it would really be great if we could do on a small scale solar power satellites to uh, beam energy into outposts that are far removed so, you know the, the middle of nowhere Afghanistan where you would have to truck in diesel uh, to uh, power generators maybe you could do it in this particular way more expeditiously and oh by the way not have to worry about uh, about attacks on convoys and things of that nature. That may be an opportunity that does exist. And of course for them, money's not really an object in the same way it is in other settings. So uh, I, I think there's economic and technical challenges on wide scale uses. There may well be some possibilities uh, in very confined and, uh, and, uh, and unique circumstances in the short term. We'll have to see what happens long term. Hi Roger. Yeah. Over here. Oh, hey. <laughs> so the space station started in 1984, and it w construction was supposed to be done in 1994. Right. And of course, it didn't get done until last year. Right. Do you think that's an impediment to building political support for a new human spaceflight mission because the decision makers are skeptical that NASA can do it, or has it actually taken so long that the decision makers <laughs> of today? don't remember that it was supposed to be done in 94, like the college students who don't remember the Berlin Wall. That's a great question. <laughs> and there's a damned if you do and damned if you don't on that one. Uh, um, you know, I, I think that um, the decision makers, some of them certainly have long memories and understand the, the situation and, 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 and may think that NASA has not been as efficient as it should in terms of carrying out these uh, And there might be some toward going for another project project like that. Um, I, I think a lot of folks are, are, are new to Congress and, and, and new to decision making uh, positions and may not have that history before them unless they're reminded of it by, by people like me uh, and you. <laughs> they, uh, they probably won't know about it necessarily. Um, so I think it works both ways but, uh, but I think there is and this is something that, that we all have to be concerned about, is I think there is some skepticism that exists, uh, not just among decision makers, but among the general public as well, about whether or not these sorts of activities are really important, whether or not they should be done, uh, what are the benefits that result from them, and, uh, and, and we don't necessarily do the best job all the time communicating uh, in that particular arena. Yeah, any more? Okay, over here. Roger, you left one out, I think. One key thing is competitiveness. Okay. That was really a big driving function. We have to compete against another country. We need to come back to that. Who, who are you going to compete against, though? I, the, 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 the issue was, I've left out the issue of competitiveness in the context of current activities. And the real question I would have in response to that is, yeah, uh, who are you going to compete against? There is no peer competitor when it comes to spaceflight uh, around the world in the same way that we were concerned about the Soviet Union in the 1960s. That just does not exist. And lots of people would like to point to China and say, that's, that's our peer competitor. And they're not there yet by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, we do not fear them the way that we feared uh, the Soviets uh, during the Cold War. It's just, it, it's not the case. And, and I don't see that changing anytime soon. I think there is a new space race underway, but it's an Asian space race. Uh, and, and I think we're going to see very interesting things happen in, in Korea and Japan and, and, uh, and, and India and China and other places in Asia in the context of these activities. And I see Jim's come up, so I am done. Thank you very much. <laughs> I wish we had time to just let Roger continue, but 